Hi there, welcome everybody, and um, thank you for joining us for today's APMG webinar in partnership with Capula. My name's Mark Constable. I'll be your host and moderator for the session, and I'm delighted to be joined by our guest presenters, Darren Conway and Andy Taylor. Uh, Darren is Cyber Security Solutions Architect at Capula and has over 25 years' experience in IT and cybersecurity. Andy has worked in information security since the mid-1980s and worked with APMG as an assessor for the Cyber Defence Capability Assessment Tool, which will feature today, better known as CDCAP. Uh, and during today's webinar, Darren and Andy will be demonstrating how organisations can easily conduct repeatable industry industrial control system risk assessments with the help of CDCAP. Um, before I hand things over to Darren and Andy, bear with me a few more moments while I cover a few logistics for the session. Uh, so the first point to note is we are recording the session and everyone that's uh, registered will receive a follow-up email from us soon after the session with a link to the recording and slides. Secondly, have an opportunity to submit questions at any time throughout the presentation. So on your GoToWebinar control panel, you should see a, a box where you can type in your questions and fire them in. Uh, so please feel free to do that. We'll, we'll be keeping an eye on those as we go and try and address as many as we can towards the end. Um, something that isn't on the screen, um, but do look out for as we go. We've got a couple of polls uh, just to just to get a uh, find out a bit more from the audience. Uh, we'll warn you when those are coming up, but uh, yeah, do look out for those. And it'd be great if you could uh, complete those for us. And last but not least, we welcome any feedback on webinars. So that helps us with planning and delivering webinars in the future. So any feedback is very welcome indeed. And you'll have email addresses either on screen or from the reminder and follow up emails. Okay, that's everything logistic wise. So heading to Darren first, I believe. So Darren, welcome, and it's over to you, sir. Nice one, thank you, Mark. Um, so I'm going to turn off my webcam. I don't, I don't necessarily um, want to take up too much of the, too much of the screen. Um, but uh, so yeah, thank you for attending, everyone. My name is Darren Conway, um, and I'm representing Capula here in the UK. And um, many of you know that Capula are a um, solutions integrator and architecture firm for industrial control systems. Um, and I, I'm getting messages that folks can't hear. Um, are, are, is everyone able to hear me? Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, all looks good from here. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah, um, Capula, a 50 year veteran um, ICS uh, architecture and integration firm. Um, we do have also a cybersecurity services uh, team and a, a full portfolio of services that we offer. And a couple of the different services that I think are relevant to what we're talking about today are around uh, risk assessments and compliance assessments, helping uh, customers identify um, their state as it, as it relates to the resilience of their um, safety and operations, um, understand their security maturity, and then also help them meet compliance. Um, and so the, the things that we're going to be talking about today um, include, but are not limited to, uh, first we'll do a little conversation on the relative uh, context um, as it relates to um, risk assessments in the industrial control system world. Uh, we'll look at the status quo as to what folks are doing for the most part to um, achieve the goals that they're trying to achieve. Um, and then we're going to look at <clears throat> how Capula and, and our services team is working with APMG International to accelerate and operationalize um, their uh, the risk assessment process. So, um, so I know that we have a bit of an international crowd here, so um, I, I'm probably going to tell you a couple of bits that you knew, uh, but then I promise to get into some things that, that perhaps you didn't. Um, so um, there's a European um, uh, network and information security regulation, which is um, targeting relevant digital service providers. Um, and so these are people who are hosting services that are, um, are important to, to the European European Union, um, and especially uh, focused, I think, um, for our customers are operators of essential services or OESs, um, and and the NIS 
um, directive and regulations are trying to help identify what these folks need to do uh, to secure themselves. And so looking at the individual security requirements, um, one of the things that's stated is that uh, these organizations and operators of essential services have to ensure a level of um, security appropriate to the risk posed. And what that means is effectively they need to be doing risk assessments. Um, and, and that is uh, uh, really the, the focus of this discussion. But once we've done a risk assess assessment, um, then what we want to try and do is implement security requirements uh, to secure the systems facilities, incident handling, business continuity management, monitoring, auditing, and testing, and then also um, do so in compliance with international standards so that um, people are effectively playing from the same uh, sheet of music. In the um, UK, the National Cybersecurity Center has identified that uh, uh, which organizations play a vital role in the society. Many of you are on the on the call right now, such as suppliers of electricity, water, water oil and gas, healthcare, things like that. Um, and um, they've also recognized that based on um, experience from previous attacks, uh, there these incidents, when, when attacks happen, the incidents can have a really big impact on the uh, environment and whatnot. So um, when we uh, do a risk assessment, we're identifying um, you know, what, what the potential impacts are and this framework, the, the NCSC Cyber Assessment Framework, or what we'll refer to as the CAF uh, moving forward, um, is there to address uh, the, the risks and um, mitigate the potential uh, significant damage from compromise. As it relates to the NCSC CAF, there's, there's a couple of elements that are important. Um, to the scope, um, I, I, I think a lot of people in in our industry, industrial control system folks, think about the ICS side of the ha the house and the cybersecurity management system. But the CAF very specifically is designated to be equally applicable to IT and OT. Um, so, so that's interesting for folks to think about when they're doing the their CAF assessments. Um, and then also as it relates to cyber resilience, so <clears throat> what the NCSC describes as being able to um, identify that you're being, or protect yourself from an attack, identify that you're being attacked, um, maintain your services, so stay up and running during the attack, and then respond and recover. All of those elements are part of uh, resilience. Um, the first thing that you need to do, again, comes to risk assessments and uh, identifying your, uh, what potential unacceptable consequences might happen in your environment if you're attacked and then the CAF framework is there to help you manage those risks from those unacceptable consequences. There's a couple of different approaches that frameworks can take um, when, when you know uh, giving uh, telling you how you should configure your environment and your policies and procedures and whatnot. And one of those um, approaches is a prescriptive rule saying that do this, this, and this, and that will put you into compliance. And in, in the case of that um, approach, you need to make sure, or what the approach needs to make sure is that it's catering to all different eventualities that might happen. Um, it, the, uh, Prescriptive approach could be complex in more rapidly changing environments. So that's something you'd need to expect. Uh, and if there are changes to the environment that were not um, uh, considered when the prescriptive rules were made, then that could lead to unintended consequences and perhaps have a limited benefit in that case. So there's another approach um, available as well, which is to use um, more of a principle-based uh, approach. And so principles are used for decision-making more so than specifically articulating what it is that you need to do. Um, and, and typically they are reinforced by outcomes, saying that you are trying to, instead of you must do this, you are trying to achieve 
this. Um, it, generally, these are supported by guidance, giving you ideas of how you can achieve them, but not specifically stating what you need to do. And then um, they um, oftentimes provide benchmarks, such as uh, indicators of good practice. This is what the, the approach that the NCSC CAF has chosen to make, is, is with the, the principles based uh, to help you uh, make decisions based on outcomes and indicators of good practice. So um, when I mentioned that the scope for the NCSC CAF um, was IT, equally IT and OT, and that the NIS um, regulation specified that you, meet, you need to meet with international standards, obviously the ISO 27001 um, standard comes up. And there are a couple of, um, a couple of areas where risk assessments come up in the conversation of the ISO 27001. When establishing an information security management program, the first things that you're doing in the early clauses are identifying who are the stakeholders for the information security management program and making sure that you establish executive ownership. Um, so you, you have to have, um, be able to enforce the elements of the program and it's the executive ownership that does that. Once you've identified stakeholders and executive ownership, the very next step that you move into is information security risk assessment. So you're trying to establish um, what are my critical assets, so what's in scope, um, what's our appetite to risk and what what do we need to do, you know, what, what might happen um, if different services or impact and, and you know, what might we do to uh, mitigate those risks. And so all of those things are things that you consider when you're establishing your information security management program, which gets you to a uh, effectively um, a solid maturity level at the beginning of the program. But then as you continue, as you move forward in time, there's life cycle management and so that's as it relates to risk assessments that is handled by a different clause within the ISO, um, ISO 27001 which is under clause 8 and here this is where it talks about um, conducting periodic risk assessments at planned intervals and and the, the, I think the things to, to consider here are have there been well one it, it should just be periodic. You should do it annually or, or have a periodic schedule to review um, your, your corporate risk. But then other triggers which might be interesting um, could be significant changes into the environment, perhaps uh, uh, acquisition or new applications coming on or a new supplier agreement. The IEC 62443 framework, which is more around um, operational technology um, uh, cybersecurity management program um, does also talk about uh, risk assessments during the establishment of, of the program and it, it talks about how to do a high-level risk assessment program identifying what's in scope and um, uh, more of the um, looking at again the things I talked about earlier from a policies and procedures perspective but then also when you get into more the, of the detailed risk assessment, you, you might start doing pen testing and, and those types of things against the, the um, equipment and applications in the environment. And then also throughout the life cycle of your um, cybersecurity management program for the operational technology side, um, there's a whole section of the 62443, which is the 3-2, uh, which talks about uh, uh, risk assessment um, uh, life cycle and, and how to handle that throughout the life. The NCSC CAF does have an indicator of good practice around risk management and um, it, it's a it's a big area to talk about with a single uh, in a uh, uh, what appears to be a single line here um, because it, it is an, in itself a program but at a high level, we can look at some of these indicators of good practice and um, it, basically there's some values here. If you match one of these statements, you have not achieved this IGP. Uh, or perhaps if you are matching these statements, then 
you are partially achieving or these statements um, you're, you're absolutely achieving these and so if we look at that the, the IGPs effectively all of the different areas of the um, CAF have indicators of good practice that I was telling you about and it's important to understand what they're trying to do with these so the purpose of the IGPs are to inform expert judgment judgment not tell you what to do um, they provide examples that you should consider and they're intended to be widely applicable what they're not is, and this is really important because I, I think this is a bit that's often missed, is they're not a checklist of, of you know, I've, I've got a spreadsheet, I'm going to follow that, I've got these questions, yes, no, yes, no, and then and then how are we doing? It's not an exhaustive list necessarily. They're, they're, su they're suggestions um, for you to consider, uh, and they are not necessarily guaranteed to apply verbatim. So you have to apply them based on your own environment. There is a bit of complexity to the um, NCSC CAF that I, I'm not sure is always appreciated, but effectively there are 39 individual assessments that can be considered in the CAF. Of, which, of those 39 individual assessments, again, what risk management was one that we, the risk management process was one we talked about. There are 444 total indicators of good practice, and each of those IGPs have on average 12 uh, different capabilities or security controls that impact those. So it, relatively complex if you if you look at it in that level. To give a little bit more detail as to what I'm talking about here, um, so we can see here, this is again that same um, uh, assess, risk assessment um, uh, evaluation that we were doing and we were talking about the risk, man risk management process not achieved on the bottom here you can see if I meet any of these security controls or capabilities on on the lower left that I have not achieved this um, this control I'm partially achieved if I'm meeting all of these different um, capabilities. So we've got service asset configuration, identifying what's, what assets um, and services we have in the environment and how are we going to configure those. Um, the architectural design, do, are we doing threat and vulnerability assessments? All of these things are required just to partially achieve risk management. And if you want to fully achieve the risk management assessment, you need to be doing controls in all of these areas. And I highlight this because, again, um, it, we're talking about this not being a checklist uh, uh, approach. Um, there's, there's really quite a lot that we need to look at to uh, be able to identify, are we actually achieving these things? So what does it mean to achieve or, or perhaps be effective? The NCSC states that, uh, and these are quotes, so I'll read them, uh, primarily a matter of expert judgment, and the IGP tables do not recruit, remove the requirement for informed use of cybersecurity expertise. So you really have to have someone who understands each of these different security capabilities and the controls to uh, make an informed judgment as to whether or not you are effective in this and you're achieving um, and they provide good starting points for the assessment but you're going to have conversations around each of these consider uh, when you're talking about a risk assessment really what you're trying to do is identify what controls you have in place and how effective are the environment or what controls are you missing? Controls that you're missing are um, uh, effectively considered um, uh oh what's the word i'm i'm drawing a blank andy help me um they are vulnerabilities sorry so an uh, an un, uh, a control that you're missing is considered a vulnerability in the environment based on the, the what we're doing here so the ncsc also um states that in reality they don't expect every organization to be at an achieved level for every all of the different controls. They expect in practice, this is going to be a life cycle that you're managing. You're gonna have some outcomes that are uh, achieved, some are partially achieved, and, and ultimately some you've identified as not applicable. So as, as a security, cybersecurity services team, 
we have, like I said earlier, um, a, uh, a portfolio that includes um, our advisory services, and we do a lot of risk assessments um, as part of those advisory services to help organizations again identify their maturity and and uh, risk and and risk treatment plans. And one of the things that I ask customers as it relates to the cyber assessment framework is, you know, how is it that you're currently handling these, um, and um, how long does it take you? Um, you know, how, how long does it take you to do a NCSC CAF assessment? And typically the, the answer that we get is that the way that people are doing these things, and, and so we're getting into the status quo here, is in the form of spreadsheets. I, I think across the board, if we were to do a poll, uh, the vast majority of you would probably say that you're doing using some form of spreadsheets uh, to do your um, assessments and um, these may be homegrown they may be something that you've used over the years and that you know is part of your toolkit and, and you've um, you've adapted them um, over time this is an example of, of what a spreadsheet um, approach might look like and here you can see the different uh, NCSC CAF principles and if you were to follow those little go to detail links you could then get a little bit more information as to you know what is what is it um, uh, what's relevant to principle A1A, board direction. And again, this you can see that's popped up here, and we can see that th this is either you've got it or you don't. There's no such thing as partially achieved as it relates to board direction. But are you, um, if you are able to match any of the statements on the um, under the not achieved, then you have to say not achieved on this and, and achieved, obviously, you need to uh, match all of the achieved statements. But more often than not, what people end up with is a red, amber, green um, deliverable. So, so when they're done with the assessment, they, they can have a bit of a security maturity picture based on, you know, we're doing really good in these areas. Here's some areas where we need improvement. And these areas, we're, we're just not doing this at all. And that that is to some degree interesting, and I, I think in a executive overview that that might be okay. Um, but as it relates to a uh, inf information management security program or cybersecurity management program, you know, we, we really have we need more than that. So the CAF itself is more about performance and not process. Um, and and when I say that performance, we're talking about <clears throat> too often people are looking at do I have the policies and procedures in place um, more so than do I have the security controls in place and how well are they implemented? And so you might have an open loop where you have policies and procedures in place, but you're not sure if they're being followed. Uh, you might have a closed loop to say, yep, we've got the, the policies and procedures are in place. And, and people have been trained on them and they're being done, or you might be optimizing. And in that case, you can say, we're actually looking to see, is this being done? We're reviewing the policies and procedures to make sure they're effective. And it's really that optimizing place that, that you're trying to get to. And that's, that's about performance. Um, so think, think about the word effective is really uh, the judgment of the assessor. So, um, Typically, I hear from customers that what they have after a risk assessment is an asset list, a captured list of controls, whether they're implemented or not. If they're implemented, um, perhaps that's that's good. If they're not, perhaps that's a, a vulnerability to the environment. We have a risk register and a maturity score, but what they don't have is an impact-based, prioritized, actionable, technical risk uh, list of treatment act risk treatment activities and and so these are all important um, adjectives so impact based which ones do I uh, of the risk treatment activities I have which ones should I implement first which ones will be most impactful uh, have I prioritized it in that way are my risk treatment activities something that I can actually put into a workflow process and have someone work on um, and and do, do, have we assigned these things off so uh, so a life cycle around that I, 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 we're going to look at, um, from a capular perspective, we understand there's um, uh, 
spreadsheets out there and ways to do the tools you can build and we've done that ourselves we built those tools but really we, we wanted to answer more of the questions around you know helping customers identify risk treatment than risk identification. And the, re the way that we did that was through a partnership with APMG. Um, and I'm gonna hand over to Andy here in a minute and, and help allow him to show you how it is that we're getting more of those actionable impact-based risk treatment activities. But I wanted to do a quick poll for y'all. Um, we did this poll um, last, uh, a, a couple of weeks ago on the LinkedIn and had some really interesting results. And so I thought it'd be fun to do the poll here. So um, it looks like we have the poll open. Um, Mark, do you wanna talk through the poll? Sure, Dan. Yep, yep. Polls open, so should be on screen for everyone now. Uh, so if we leave it on for I don't know, 20 seconds or so, I, I can see how many have voted. It looks like uh, people's winning out quite consistent, uh, considerably at the minute. Yes, that's most votes in, and it's uh, hovering around 86% on people. Okay. 9% um, on process, and 5 on technology. Nothing for data. That is crazy. Oh, my goodness. Look at this. So we did this poll. Now on the slide, I, uh, ideally, you can see my slide again. This is the poll that we ran on uh, LinkedIn. And that those were the results. 82% uh, went people and 9% and process or process, whichever the side of the, the pond you're from. Uh, so I, I believe the correct answer is process. I believe that if you have um, policies and procedures in place, they will dictate what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. And part of those process, those procedures should be checking that it's done, that the individuals who are responsible for this are doing it, and also auditing that it's being checked. Um, so it's, it's almost impossible for people to be the problem if in fact you have the um, adequate processes uh, and uh, procedures and uh, process, policies and procedures in place. Um, think, about, think about that, folks. Um, really, ideally, in your environments, people should not be allowed uh, to, to pose the greatest risk if you have a well-structured um, uh, information security management program and cybersecurity management program. With that, um, I am going to, that was very interesting, uh, I'd like to hand over to Andy. So I'm going to change presenter, Andy. You should uh, now be in control. That's grand. Thanks so much indeed. And hopefully people can see my screen. Just need to swap displays, Andy, because uh, we've got the uh, wonderful screen mode on our side. See the right. presenter screen in a bit. Let me just do that then. Let's have that one then. How's that? Perfect. Thanks for that. Okay. And um, good afternoon, everybody. I, I want to take you back to 2009. Um, you may remember, if you were working in security around about that time, there was a horrible worm around called Configure. And Configure had a huge impact in a number of different places, but in particular, it happened on the MOD uh, systems, uh, had quite an impact on, on uh, operational requirements and other, uh, other factors within the MOD. And as a result of that, the MOD turned around to their research and development arm, DSTL, the Defence Scientific and Technical Laboratories, and said, OK, to stop this happening in the future, tell us what good security looks like. What do we need to do in order to uh, make sure that we don't end up with the same problem again? So DSTL looked around, couldn't find anything terribly suitable that met the requirements of doing the job properly, but also met some quite stringent requirements that the MOD had put upon them. Firstly, they made, it, made sure that it was evidence-based. It couldn't just uh, be good ideas or blue sky thinking or anything like that. It had to systematically connect, collect the evidence in order to make sure that uh, they could prove that things were happening as they should be doing. It needed to be uh, entirely scalable 
from anything from a single laptop up to a warship or anything like that. And it needed to be quick because the idea was that you wouldn't just do this once a year or once every uh, audit period. You do it as often as necessary. And if you think about the MOD's environment, uh, their threat environment changes very rapidly. You move a warship from uh, the middle of the Atlantic to the middle of the Black Sea, you've got a very different threat of our environment. And so they needed something that could uh, uh, cope with that and could be used to, to check on a, on a frequent basis. And so these three circles were, were brought together. Firstly, the, the standard information assurance type stuff. Secondly, looking at uh, network operations and how to defend them. And then finally, the service management side, and the service management side is critical. Uh, and where those join, we end up with uh, a, a, a decision making tool, uh, which allows you to actually look at how things are operating uh, and how effective they are in, uh, in sorting out your cybersecurity. So the result of that was CDCAT. CDCAT stands for the Cyber Defense Capability Assessment Tool. It was developed by DSTL and indeed is still owned by the MOD and DSTL, but it helps you to understand your operational risk, be that reputational or market or any other sort of risk. It's, it's the operational side of life that it's bothered about. It ensures effective defenses across your organization and indeed down your supply chain as well. It can be used in any variety of places. It can be used uh, in, in any shape or form of, of system. Uh, it can work on, on Apple systems or Windows systems or indeed Ada systems for that matter. Um, so it, it is entirely scalable and suitable for any sort of system. And it provides input to investment decisions in particular. So where are, you aren't spending enough money, but equally perhaps where you're spending too much money and therefore you can uh, adjust your security budget to some degree. It helps ensuring that contracts are available, looking at outsourcing or third party suppliers or anything else that's like that. And it's quick and repeatable. And those two factors are uh, very important. The fact that it doesn't take long uh, and you can keep doing it and it produces consistent results each time means that not only can you do that, but you can actually then compare systems or parts of an organization. So you might be able to compare how secure one element is in comparison to another. Is marketing better than human resources or is this site better than that site? And if so, why? What is the difference between them? It also goes much beyond compliance. It can be used for compliance. It has that facility within the tool, but it's designed primarily to do effectiveness, to look at how effective the uh, cybersecurity operations are and the uh, capabilities that you're operating are in, in your uh, particular environment. The way in which it was built was that it pulls together two life cycles, the standard cyber life cycle or NIST life cycle, if you prefer, uh, and the service management life cycle. And I made mention of service management earlier. Uh, it's very clear that if you're going to have high quality security, you're going to need high quality service management. But equally, good quality service management isn't good unless it also addresses security. Those two are, are totally independent, uh, totally dependent on each other. It looks at uh, defined processes and compliance if you wanted to, but it's much better at looking at the complexity and the effectiveness. Now, Darren's very adequately, very well indeed, explained the complexity of the CAF and how many bits and pieces have to be put together in order to make each one of those statements uh, applicable or otherwise uh, or, or acceptable. So the complexity of the CAF is, is a, a nightmare. If you're trying to do that in a piecemeal way, you just lose track of it all, I, su I suggest. It also identifies the absence of a defend capability. And as Darren quite rightly said, uh, we class those as vulnerabilities. They're your weaknesses. They're areas where you're likely to get attacked because the classic uh, weakest link in a chain is the one that's going to be the one that uh, lets you down. The assessments, as I say, are consistent, they can be repeated, and they're therefore looking at uh, uh, operational risk management uh, in a true holistic way. And it looks at all the ways in which your systems are currently working and then identifies bits that could be better or uh, indeed maybe even missing altogether. This is the matrix of what it looks like. Now, 
Uh, it looks very simple across the top. You can see the standard uh, cyber life cycle. In the UK, we talk about assess, deter, protect, detect, respond, recover. The US and Darren will talk about identify instead of assess, but the language is much the same. And then the horizontally, you can see then service strategy, design, transition, operation, and continuous service improvement. And that's the life cycle of service management. I would stress that these uh, elements that you can see here, these are different cyber uh, security capabilities. Uh, when we talk about capabilities rather than controls, or as well as controls, I have to say, I personally tend to interchange the words, but we talk about capabilities because a lot of these are not necessarily technical capabilities. Things like, for example, on this screen, red teaming and training, that's not a technical capability. It's, it's very, uh, not, not a technical control, sorry, it's very much more a capability. And, and so it's a mixture of those two. And ultimately, there are 159 of these uh, capabilities within the tool itself. And it's all 159 that are considered when we're looking at an assessment. And you can see how some go across several areas of the cyber life cycle and the ones down the side go across several areas of the uh, service management life cycle. This is the top layer of a five layer model. So a hierarchical model with this is just the very top layer. So behind this is much, much more detail going down into some very detailed uh, individual capabilities or controls uh, further down into the system. So how do we use this? Well, the engagement uh, methodology is very straightforward. Uh, we start off with a, with a scoping uh, meeting, usually a face-to-face -face meeting in, in good old days, probably now it might be done by video call. Uh, and we talk about the, the systems that you want to assess. So we'd look at the scope of it. Which ones are you looking at? Uh, in particular, what are any, uh, any uh, interfaces that that particular system might have with other systems or with the internet or anything else? Are there particular risks or threats to that particular system uh, because of its nature, because of its location, because of its environment, whatever that might be, and, and any other environmental factors that might be? We talk about your risk appetite. What are you aiming for? Because for certain systems, it might be a level five maturity uh, where basically you don't want to lose anything at all. You don't want to uh, suffer any uh, attack that might be successful. Or in other systems, you can't afford to have that or don't need to have that level of security. And so you can drop it back down, down the uh, maturity levels down to three or two or whatever it might be. And you can set your target maturity wherever you like. As a result of that meeting, uh, the, the tool automatically produces a thing that we call the capability snapshot. That's just a simple questionnaire. It's done delivered in, in Excel. Uh, and for each of the capabilities that we've decided we're going to assess, uh, we give you a very simple question. It, it's almost a yes, no question. Um, and then if we say, if, if the answer is yes, we ask you to grade it. How well do you think that particular system is working in your environment? And, and it's intended as a very, very quick uh, if you take longer than half an hour on it or so, uh, it's too long. It's intended to be a very quick um, assessment of your current capabilities based on what you think, on your opinions as a client, as a customer. How well do you think that's operating? We use those uh, responses for, for two, pro predominantly for two main reasons. Firstly, uh, we're a little bit sneaky in that we compare those answers with the ones that we get out of the full assessment at the end of the process, and we give you a flavour of how confident you are, perhaps overconfident, on the, uh, the way in which your systems are operating, what we call optimism bias. But much, much more importantly, it tells us who we need to be talking to when we come to do the full assessment, because the full assessment is an interview assessment, and this is stage three. We carry that out. Um, and to give you a flavour, if you're going to do the top 25 or so capabilities, and I'll talk about why 25 in a minute, uh, then that's probably going to take about half a day. And that's why it's quick. It's half a day of assessment time to give you the full report that you'll see at the end uh, with all the helpful guidance and, and hints and tips that, that Darren's already alluded to. And then stage four, uh, looking at the reports, deciding what that means, uh, perhaps uh, taking action or deciding on a, on a case that uh, uh, further action is necessary in particular places and, and so on and so forth. Now, in the tool itself, we talk about capability strategy groups. Now, a strategy group is simply uh, a collection of these 159 capabilities. 
So we don't need to look at all of them because not all of them are specifically related to any particular area. And we block bunch these together into groups, as you can see on the screen here. It covers, for example, ISO 27000. Uh, it covers the uh, uh, Australian Signals Directorate standards, uh, NIST frameworks, uh, PCI DSS for those that might be involved in finance, and so on and so forth. Uh, one here is, is a cyber essential scheme. Um, we can do a, a standalone assessment now using this tool uh, for those who are involved in the, in the cyber essential scheme. But import, in, more importantly than that, uh, if we start looking at one of those in particular, and I happen to have picked on the CPNI iData kill chain idea, you can see how that's broken down into a number of different strategies. You can select the whole lot, or you can select any one of these particular areas. So you might, for example, look at uh, exfiltration detection uh, or prevention. The beauty of these strategies is that you can mix and merge these. You can have your own, uh, or you can develop your own if you wish to do so. You can use the ones that are preset, or you can mix any ones that you like. You can take one that's preset and adapt it. Uh, any of these uh, combinations can be done. The CDCAT Classic that's talked about here are the top 25 controls. And by top, I mean the ones that evidence has shown are the most important of the capabilities that you should have in your organization. If you aren't looking after those top 25 or so capabilities, then you really have bigger problems. And you can fiddle around with the lower ones if you wish to do so, but you'll get no return on that. And those are quite critical. And I'll come back to that ranking system in just a moment or two. The report that's produced is, is fully automatic. You don't need to do anything except push a button. Uh, and it comes out in a whole variety of different areas. Uh, firstly, there are two uh, summary reports, uh, what we call the executive summary report, a very high level, just a couple of pages, quite literally. And then an assessment summary report, which is about seven or eight pages. And they're designed quite explicitly for senior managers. Uh, they're intended to be in non-technical language so they can understand them and get a, a gist, a feel for what it's all about. Oh, that's just uh, not done what I expected it to do. That's better. Uh, Appendix A is just a definition of terms, a glossary of terms. No uh, great surprises there. Just make sure everybody's talking the same language. Appendix B is the full assessment details. Uh, and it provides you with a prioritized list of areas on which you should be concentrating. And it includes actions to address those technical issues. Uh, that comes from the uh, uh, KPEC MIDA database, uh, and it provides you with actual actions. And I'll, I'll give you a uh, an illustration of that in a moment or two. Appendix C is where you can select a, uh, a standard against which you want to have a report. This particular one uh, looks at the NIST report, the 853 report. Uh, it could be ISO 27000 or it could be any of the others that I showed you earlier. Uh, it won't necessarily be fully completed because you haven't looked at every single capability within that particular framework, then clearly those, those areas will be uh, empty. But it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. It's a many-to-many -many relationship, so you'll get more information in some than others, and, and some may be empty. Appendix D is then what we call a high-level action plan. Uh, this again is a rank list of vulnerabilities, of weaknesses, of, of areas where you are not as strong as you might be. Um, and it includes then good practice guidance from the UK government, from NCSC, on how to sort out those areas. So again, this is a, a, an action plan for you. You can take that guidance and use it and feed it into your systems or into your uh, process, uh, workflow processes uh, in order to get things done for you. Appendix E is looking at performance indicators, and that's specifically for those who are working at level four and five maturity, because that requires performance indicators to, to be able to operate at level five. This appendix, uh, if you're up at those sort of levels, gives you guidance on how to install those performance indicators, what sort of results you should expect, and any issues around it. And then the final one, Appendix F, uh, F is simply the full assessment data of information that you've put in. And to give you a flavor of that, here's a uh, a, a couple of snippets out of a, an executive summary report. Uh, so here's an assessment that was done. It was done uh, using the ISO 27000 standard. Uh, you can see the number of controls that were, were looked at. 
you can see some were added in, in uh, as well. Uh, and you get the classic traffic lights. So anything that's green, that's at the required level of maturity that you set in your target maturity level, uh, at that level of maturity or indeed above it. The yellowy or orangey ones, they're the ones that are one level below that target maturity and the red ones are two or more levels below that level of maturity. We also collect some information that we call blockers. Uh, blockers are, so what's stopping you getting to the next level of maturity? And it might be things like training or uh, logistical issues under logics, uh, logistical issues, that would be things like budget. Uh, training might well be uh, because you can't train or because you haven't got the right people to be trained or they're lacking training, whatever it might be. But these are things which, as I say, are stopping you getting to the next level of maturity. And we give you some advice on how to fix those as well. And finally, uh, in this particular snippet, uh, this is the ranked list. So these are the capabilities, the controls that were particularly weak in this particular assessment. I would stress, by the way, this is a fictional assessment. It's not a real organization. Uh, but nevertheless, it gives you a flavor of how it's produced. So you can see here from the uh, moderate up to the critical levels of vulnerability, er, the, the particular areas of your cybersecurity systems that you need to think about. If I go on to Appendix B, now this is the full technical um, assessment report. Uh, you can see here, again, a ranked list of the controls and the capabilities where you need to worry. It gives you the rank status. It tells you you were targeting at level three. You're only at level one. And what, uh, level one means it's an ad hoc process. You're doing something, but nothing very organized. And it gives you a flavor as to what to do about it. So again, this is a prioritized list telling you where to concentrate, where to worry. We also give you a little bit of financial information. Uh, this is an interesting uh, area. Uh, it, it, it has its value. I, I'm not sure it's entirely 100%, but it really has its value. So here's a, a picture and it says, basically, uh, if you put no uh, controls in place, no uh, any, any sort of cybersecurity controls or capabilities in place, then your risks are gonna be as listed where those lines cross the left hand, the, the uh, Y axis. Uh, and you can see where we've got average risk, minimum risk, and, ma and max risk. So an average risk in this particular case is just under, under 150,000. Because you've put some controls in place, you've gone down that curve. If you take the worst case maturity, um, then you get level one. In other words, some of your controls, as we can see in the screen above, in the, in the box above, some of your controls were at level one. So that's your worst case. So you've reduced your risk a little bit from 150,000 down to perhaps 125,000 or something like that. Where your average maturity score was in the assessment is around about level two. So that's reduced it further down to something like 75,000. But maybe your target was level three, which would take it down to less than 50,000, 40, 45,000 perhaps. And then you can say to your bosses, well, that's fine. But if you want to get up to level five, that will take your risk, your risk of a, a the cost of a, of a breach down to next to zero. But that's not trivial. That's going to cost you a lot of money and take time. Is that really something you want to do or not? So you can start to have intelligent conversations with decision makers, with financiers on the basis of what that risk means and, and the consequences of it for your uh, purse, for your finances. On the right hand side now, this is an extract from the database I was talking about. So here are some of the attacks that your severe vulnerability might be subjected to and how to sort it out. And if you look particularly, you can see that it says administrators should disable support for. Make sure to perform in input validation on, on uh, data and so on and so forth. So it's giving you a clear uh, advice as to things you should be considering. Now, not all of this will necessarily apply to your system because some of these may not cover things that you've got on your system. But nevertheless, it's again giving you clear advice and guidance as to how to deal with the particular issues that they've discovered during the assessment. Appendix C, now again, this is from the NIST framework. Uh, and as I say, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. So you can see, for example, that CA2, Security Assessments, has a number of different uh, capabilities and, and uh, uh, controls linked against it. 
Uh, those, by the way, that are in, in italics there, it's because part of that has been assessed uh, in addition to anything else. So part of IA and architecture design as a, as a control area has been assessed, but not the whole thing. But you can see again, you're getting that RAG status. Uh, you can see where you've got some issues, some that are performing fine. So the auditing bit's not too bad by the looks of things. Whereas the uh, policy and procedure bit, not very good and, and so on and so forth. These are all uh, automatically produced, remember, there's no manual input to this other than just doing the assessment. Uh, in level uh, Appendix D, we now look at the high level action plan. Uh, and again, you can see that there's some uh, ranked uh, statements here. These are the controls this time ranked in their level of importance. And you can see here, there's the ranking. Now, this is done, as I say, on the basis of an input from a number of different places. Uh, inputs from GCHQ, from NSA in America and elsewhere, uh, from the Australian Signals Directorate, and a unique input from NATO. Uh, all NATO countries are required to report what they're being attacked by and how they're defending themselves. And all that information is fed in, and using some very clever mathematics, it then ranks all 159 capabilities in their most important. So the ones that come up the top of that list are the ones that are most frequently mentioned as being good defences against the things that are attacking. So these are the ones that are going to give you maximum, if you like, uh, bang for your bucks. These are the ones you should be concentrating on. And that ranked list is in the CDCAT tool uh, ready for you to use. On the right hand side down here, so this is good practice. This is uh, from the UK's uh, National Cyber Security Centre, their 10 steps of cyber security. And again, you can see it tells you, you should be doing this. You should consider that. You should establish a data loss prevention uh, strategy and so on. And related to the controls that you've got, you've now got a ranked list of things that you need to be doing. You need to be thinking about, you need to be considering uh, putting into place. The report formats, so that's a list of all the various uh, elements of the report that comes out, as I say, all automatically produced. Uh, the summary report and the executive summary, those are the two which are uh, designed quite explicitly for senior managers, uh, non-technical, but easy to understand. And I don't mean that uh, in a uh, disparaging way at all, just doesn't need a lot of uh, technical expertise to understand it. And then the various appendices, uh, going through the various bits, of which I covered a few here today. It's all done in Word, so you can top and tail it how you like as well. We also allow, uh, allow it to download into Excel. And the reason we do that is that sometimes some of the elements of this are best suited to Excel because then you can sort it. You can sort out the ordering of things. You can manage the way in which that uh, Excel spreadsheet uh, deals with particular areas. And it may be that taking that format allows you to feed that in, if not directly, at least pretty easily into a workflow uh, or some other system like that, which allows you to take that on in a, in a realistic way. So that's the basis of the CDCAT tool um, and, and the way in which it produces its report. And I hope it's explained to you that it can deal with this complexity that Darren uh, talked about earlier. Uh, it is quick. Uh, if you do those top 25 controls, uh, which are the ones you really should be concentrating on, that's about half a day of assessment time, uh, a bit uh, beforehand in preparation and certainly some afterwards in order to deal with what the report has said. But it can be done repeatedly. Uh, it also gives you a system which allows you to compare different systems, the security on different systems as, as most appropriate to you. So I'll hand back to Darren now and uh, he can take you forward through to the last little bit of this. <clears throat> Excellent, Andy. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, that you know, I think that was what we were hoping to cover. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, Capula, we offer um, this uh, platform as part of our risk assessment service offering. Um, so if you're interested in, in you know, seeing seeing how this might work for your organization, I think you know one of the interesting things that Andy had said earlier is that you know. Um, 
it can be done very quickly. Um, and I get back to what I had said previously, which is that we, um, I, I often ask customers, how long does it take you to do a CAF assessment? And they say, well, <clears throat> three days or so to, you know, do get, uh, do the interviews and and look at the qualifying evidence and things like that um, and then you know maybe a, a week or two to go and kind of digest all of that and to write a report and then at the end of that they I don't think they um, necessarily always have the list of all the risk treatment activities I think the value of this platform is is the way that we can help um, you know not only identify what are the issues but say these are the very specific, impact-based, prioritized, actionable, technical risk treatment activities. And, and, and to me, that's, that's really closing the loop um, on the risk assessments we would be happy to, one, entertain any questions. Does anyone have any questions? I, I think we can put questions into the chat box. I'm, I'm not sure, Mark, um, are, are you going to open up the lines or how, how do you want to uh, I'll, I'll, yeah I can see the questions uh, I can see a couple in front of me at the moment um, so I'll start okay. with one from Steve um, could CDCAT also be used for uh, to assess GD, GDPR compliance so um, Andy are the is there yeah, so it, the it yes the um, yeah GDPR is uh, is interestingly is, is a very complex area again rather like the CAF uh, yes we've mapped GDPR in uh, yes it can be done uh, it is um, a, a complex assessment and, it, and it's as I say similar to the CAF in some ways insofar as it's uh, it, it's not just a simple you know here's one statement and here's one capability that deals with it there are many capabilities for any one of those statements but yes it can be used for that Great, thanks guys. Uh, second question, uh, can these reports be sent directly to Ofgen? So I, I can feel that. Um, I, I've gotten that before. So um, it, it's a yes and no. So ideally you're gonna get the report and it's gonna have your um, impact-based list of risk treatment activities in it, but you as an organization and perhaps working with Capula, we can help you come up with with a plan, you need to decide which of these are we actually going to take on and, and what are we going to do with this. So um, uh, the tool may have identified these are your different um, vulnerabilities, um, you should mitigate in this order, but you might choose to do things differently. And if that's the case, then, then you, you um, likely are going to be taking the risk treatment activities that are provided here and then putting those into a final report that you forward to off Jim. Great. Thanks, Darren. Uh, and one more question from Mark. Uh, can CDCAT be used for maritime ICU risk assessments? Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, it can be used for any system at all. Um, I talked about the scoping meeting at the beginning. That's where you decide exactly what it is you want to look at. Uh, I've actually done assessments of ships, uh, of, of uh, uh, RFAs in particular. Uh, it was also done on a uh, Type 45 for those that are suitably inclined. Uh, so yes, it can be done. Uh, you just need to scope it accordingly and you pick out the bits and pieces that are particular pertinent, particularly pertinent to that particular uh, environment. Uh, and you can modify the strategy you use, the selection of capabilities and controls that you use to match the particular environment in which you're operating. Okay, thanks Andy and thanks Darren. That, uh, that brings us very close to the hour so I think we better start wrapping up there. Is there yeah. anything else anything else you guys wanted to add before we before we wrap oh, up? We had that, yeah, that last um, questionnaire there. Oh, it's, it's the poll. Yeah, let's get that on screen now. Okay. So that should be on screen for everyone. Uh, so we just give a, a few seconds to complete that. So if you're interested in seeing a CD cat in action, just let us know one of those options. And while you're answering that, I, do, I just want to thank everyone for, for dialing in. Um, really appreciate your time, and I, I hope um, this has been a useful uh, uh, 
uh, hour of your day um, looking at the the calf looking at the complexity of the calf and and hopefully um, uh, identifying a way that it might be able to help operationalize um, uh, your, your calf assessments yeah thanks Dan. and we'll, we'll close the poll there so we've got uh, 70 around 70 percent for option one uh, who see an opportunity uh, just under 10 percent still a little one sure and uh, just under just over 20 percent sorry so don't see the opportunity at this stage okay okay so thanks very much everyone as, as Darren said for, for joining us today and taking time out of uh, busy schedules to join us we do appreciate it we hope you found it uh, useful and informative um, and just a final thing before we close, a reminder that we, we have recorded this session today and we'll, we'll get a follow-up email sent um, uh, once we've run through some of the follow-up activity, uh, so do look out for that as we'll include some uh, additional links and info in there. So thanks again everyone and enjoy the rest of your week ahead. Bye-bye now.